Hey everybody, it is Andrew Lowen and uh, designer of Deliverance here with a special video. I wanted to spend some time uh, really kind of diving into my history of gaming. And I feel like the games that I've played in the past are very relevant to a lot of people that are following Deliverance. And so I thought what I would do is go over each genre of game that I've played and then later in YouTube, we will kind of splice it so that each game is, um, uh, each each genre is talked about. So I know that, um, now there are a couple of disclaimers I'd like to make right off the bat, or I don't know, notes I'd like to you to uh, know right off the bat. The first one is, some of this may not make any sense to you. If I go into a genre of game that you've never played before, it might not make any sense. But it's going to make a lot of sense to the people who have played that genre of game that are very familiar with it. And that's really what I want to do. I want to dive into the little niches of the gaming world, whether video games, card games, board games, and share with you my history and my experience. And um, I would love to get really specific as far as the games that were very influential in uh, to me and what I loved about them and what design lessons I took from them. So game designers might like to listen to the whole thing, um, but people that are really looking to back Deliverance or look into why Deliverance is, you know, why I'm qualified to make a good and innovative game, um, why Deliverance might be innovative, it's, um, it, this video is kind of meant to answer questions related to to that. So let's just jump right into it. Um, a broad overview first. I um, want to cover Japanese RPGs, uh, collectible card games, MMORPGs, uh, mobile online battle arenas is basically Dota, League of Legends, and, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, now digital collectible card games, I am putting that in a different category. So Hearthstone in particular, um, I'll put in a different category. Action RPGs, so things like Diablo, um, uh, Baldur's Gate, um, Sacred, and Path of Exile, those are uh, there, and um, com both competitive and co-op board games. I'm splitting them into competitive and co-op because, um, I mean, there are so many little genres of games, and I might highlight some of them, but I really want to want to do that. So let me write a note for myself so that I don't forget in action RPGs. Um, I really need to add, uh, so Diablo, Path of Exile, Sacred, and uh, one more that I completely forget now that I just said, but hopefully I'll remember when I get to that section. All right, I do have a list of notes in case uh, you're wondering. So first off, let's start out with Japanese RPGs. Um, the, the most influential Japanese RPGs that I've played are Secret of Mana, Chrono Trigger, Secret of Evermore, Final Fantasy VII, um, Final Fantasy Tactics, and uh, there are a bunch of others. A bunch of others from the Final Fantasy series and, um, you know, beyond that. And I I just, I feel like certain games, you know, have had more of an impact on me than others. And I thought I'll just get into the most impactful ones. So um, Secret of Mana was the first Japanese RPG that I ever played. I played it on Super Nintendo. I was like 10 years old. And... It was it really blew my mind. The fact that you could actually level a character and grow in power and become more awesome and that sort of thing. It just really uh, was the first time my mind ever expanded to to realize that, hey, I could do this. Um, you know, the, the first lesson right away that I applied to deliverance was that sense of character progression. I really wanted you to progress and feel like you were growing in power, and that was something that I feel like Japanese RPGs do very well. Where, in actuality, they are kind of linear, meaning there's only one way to go in order to go from, like, the beginning to the end. You have to do this first, and then beat that boss next, and go to the ice land next, and then the fire land after that, or whatever it is, right? But you, it feels like you can run around, because you can go out, and fight bad guys, and then return to the town, which is kind of a place of safety, buy new gear and whatnot, and then you get to the next world, and you get to get an entirely new set of gear, and I 
I loved that sense of progression. Also, it introduced the grind. So there, there's something interesting and, and fun about grinding in a video game. Um, in particular, with this one, Final Fantasy VII really stands out because I couldn't just beat Final Fantasy VII. I had to go master Knights of the Round, and which was uh, which, you know, won't make any sense at all to people who aren't familiar with Final Fantasy VII, uh, the old school PlayStation version of Final Fantasy VII. But you would have to basically run back and forth, con you know, over and over and over again. Um, I remember I had the Apocalypse Sword. I was trying to fight magic pots, and I would have to give them elixirs, and it just it took forever to finally master this. Um, it was basically a, a spell called Knights of the Round, a materia that would give, and if you master it, you get a second copy of it. So, uh, which was really important for me to do awesome stuff. I basically beat the last boss in like two moves or something, or one move, and it it just took like thirty minutes of automated stuff happening for i was basically programming in final fantasy 7 i would uh cast knights of the round like 16 times um and it was enough to beat the boss just in in i think one swing so anyway um i developed kind of a love for grinding in in final fantasy 7 if you play deliverance there's really not a whole lot of grinding going on meaning you know you you don't have to abuse or, or like run around um, you don't have to abuse the experience system you don't have to run around and constantly convince the demons to oppress the saints so that you can get one more experience point by flipping the saint back to its protected side um, but there really is something special about grinding in a game um, grinding experience so you uh, go into a zone and you fight a bunch of mobs that are or, or enemies and you get experience for them, and then you leave that area only to re-enter it again so those enemies respawn, and you gain more experience by defeating them again. And you do that over and over again. And there's something satisfying about just simply seeing your progress, your level bar kind of go up. Um, I'll kind of, maybe I'll talk about that more in games like, you know, MMOs like World of Warcraft and whatnot. But um, that, that left a real lasting impression. I did not implement grinding in in uh, Deliverance, um, maybe a little bit, but there's something from Japanese RPGs that I, that I implemented that I absolutely love in the campaign. And this, is, it actually comes from Chrono Trigger. Um, Chrono Trigger is a game that, that originally came out on the Super Nintendo that was probably the best RPG I've ever played. It's, it's definitely the number one Japanese RPG. Um, I uh, played it as a kid. I remember my, actually my class, I went to a little private school and a little private Lutheran school and as a kid and my class pitched in and bought me this game for $60 that was Chrono Trigger and it was extremely fun and, and um, uh, it was a, a great game. And this actually was a game that had certain things that you could, that you may never, you know, it was like hidden um, little Easter eggs. You, you could get certain characters like one character was like a big bad guy that you could actually get to fight on your team uh magus and that was really cool but um there were a bunch of things that you would have to do in order to make it happen it was a m little bit more of a sandbox experience instead of linear you could only go here and do this and that you actually had choices about where you would go even though there was only one way to advance the story there were a lot of um uh different little things you could you know, go explore here and there. Um, what I found most impactful about Chrono Trigger was this concept of New Game Plus. So the way that it would work in Chrono Trigger is you would play through the game and you would beat the game, and then you would be able to start what is called a New Game Plus. So instead of just creating a new game, what Chrono Trigger would do is it would take, there were, I believe, three save files that you could load up. So if you only played one game, you would... Um, uh, you, you know, you would have to, um, uh, well, anyway, we'll put it this way. If you, uh, played through one game and beat it, you had two empty saves and one that was finished. You could start a new game plus on one of those other two empty, um, saves. And the, the game would give you kind of a combined 
um, experience of, uh, you know, and items and gear and everything like that um, of both of the other save files. So the game that you just finished and you got like all this epic gear and then the brand new game, you would kind of end up with like middle of the road gear for, you know, about halfway through the game. But you would start with this awesome gear right away and it made the first half of the game extremely easy. Now, if you beat the game a second time on a new save file, the third game that you would play, you had like you basically had the best gear in the game because it was it would average out both of the other games and they were amazing. It was amazing gear. And there was a little secret that you could go find the final boss at the beginning of the game. There was this little thing that it was like a little sparkly thing on the ground when you only had yourself and then one other character. You didn't have all of your characters yet. Um, but you would you would get this um, – you would hit this button and it would basically transport you to fight the final boss right away. And that was – I just thought that was really cool. In New Game Plus, you would be able to fight the final boss in a unique way, and that left a lasting impression on me. And this translates to Deliverance, really, because the the campaign, after you've finished, and I guess kind of segues into board games a little bit, but after you finish a typical campaign in a board game, like, you know, a game like Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth, you have this awesome character that you finish this campaign and now you're done and you have to restart everything and you can't use that awesome character anymore. So um, with New Game Plus, you could. And I really loved that. So I loved the fact that in Deliverance, I, I, I made it so that after you finish the 14 mission campaign, that you get to start on these epic challenges. And this is kind of a new game plus where you get to keep your awesome character but also to uh, compete in versions of the missions that you just played through that are really hard or different or unique and challenging in, in some new way and I love the the idea of getting to play with your awesome character and see if you can actually beat the game on the on like the hard difficulty settings with your awesome overpowered super cool character and um, that just you know I know that some people aren't really into fighting games at like on the hardest difficulties or anything, but a lot of other people are. And this was the type of content that was pretty easy to add in. It just, you know, you would never add it in if you just didn't have that experience. And so coming from that world, that was something that I really loved. And I found, I just, I think is extremely cool. Another area in the Japanese RPG that was um, influential uh, to the new game plus concept was in final fantasy seven. You got to fight. So you, you could make it through the game and fight the, the final boss and y you know, you'd beat the game, but there were these other bosses that were optional, completely optional that were way harder than the final boss, much harder. And they were meant as optional bosses that you could fight. If you just, you know, maximized your characters and got really good at the game and that sort of thing. They were called Emerald Weapon and Ruby Weapon. And they were just kind of floating around harmlessly in, you know, certain areas. And if you ran into them with your character on the world map, all of a sudden this fight would begin. And um, if you weren't prepared for it, you would just get decimated, right? And uh, so to figure out how to win was part of the fun, you know. Um, one of the bosses would actually take one of your characters that you have a three-character party in Final Fantasy VII. They would actually remove your character permanently from the game, like suck him into the sand, basically, and you couldn't play with that character during that battle. And sometimes they would actually uh, absorb two characters, and you would be just wrecked. You would, you would get completely destroyed. Um, and so the strategy was to... Um, that I that I found out was I start on accident. I started with one of my characters that was defeated already, and that character that was defeated ended up sticking around. And so I revived them as my first action, and I got to fight that boss with two characters. So I came back after I lost, and started with two characters defeated, and um, I was able to revive both of them and uh, heal up, and then fight the boss with three characters and finally win. And that felt really rewarding. Um, so. The, the last Japanese RPG that was extremely influential, the most influential Japanese RPG on Deliverance, was called Final Fantasy Tactics. 
this was um, had a lot of the same things that were popular in, you know, that I discussed about Japanese RPGs. It had grinding for more experience and levels. It had character progression and that sort of thing. But this was almost like Final Fantasy ta or Final Fantasy mixed with a chessboard. So you would play on a grid and you'd move your characters on a grid, you know, and you if you had a, a skill that had a range of three, it would be three spaces away from your character. And this basically served as the foundation for the way that Deliverance's tactical combat works. And I think there are a lot of tabletop games that um, where it's the same way. You know, you've got your tactical combat on the grid that works in a similar way to the great Final Fantasy Tactics or Fire Emblem or Ogre Battle 64, I think is another one that, that used the uh, same system. So um, that was extremely influential. The various skills and the things that you could do on the grid in Final Fantasy Tactics were easily, in fact, if I went back through that game, I could probably find a way to turn every single one of the abilities in the game into, or, or the enemies in the game, into either a demon or an angel skill or something like that. Um, that game by itself actually probably gives me enough ammo that I could just go back and make an expansion or two from, from all the things there. So, um, so that was Japanese RPGs. Let's move into collectible card games. So um, when I say collectible card games, I'm talking about Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, uh, the World of Warcraft trading card game, and a bunch of others that have been since, uh, you know, have just risen and died over the years, you know. Collectible card games were really hot in the 90s. I remember um, at about 13 years old, Pokemon Red and Blue came out uh, for the Game Boy. And this is dating myself now. But um, the, uh, the, the trading card game, Pokemon trading card game came out. And for whatever reason, I got really interested in it. We started playing the Game Boy game. And then I got into the card game more like initially just being a kid collecting the cards. And... Then after I met um, my buddy Brighton, who actually is Uriel in the uh, in Deliverance, he's the model for Uriel. He he and I just started playing Pokemon really really competitively. We started going to tournaments at our local game store every single fr uh, it was every single Sunday or every Saturday something like that. Every Saturday morning I think we had a Pokemon tournament and we would always do pretty well. And the thing is, if you win the Pokemon tournament, you get to have prizes. You would put like $5 in or $10 in, and that would enter you into the tournament. And you would get a free pack of cards for entering into the tournament. But if you win the tournament, you would get like 10 packs or something, you know? And the um, and being a 14-year-old kid, I didn't have a job or anything like that. I would ask for money from grandma or my mom or save up money or find change and and hold on to it. We didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid. And, um, we, uh, and then I would go there on the weekend with my buddy, oftentimes with my buddy and play in a Pokemon tournament. Um, we would spend hours and hours at each other's house playing competitively against each other over and over again in Pokemon to try to just optimize our deck for, um, the tournament. And come up with new strategies that were innovative. And I remember just, you know, many, many hours laying on the floor of my friend's room and, you know, playing another game, playing another game. And then we'd stop and we'd separate into our corners and secretly adjust our decks so that we could, you know, uh, try to pull a fast one on the other person and, and surprise them with something they hadn't seen and come up with a new strategy that, that ripped it up. And my buddy Brighton frustrating as it is he was always better than me at these types of games so he would always edge me out and honestly he probably cheated a little bit too and maybe i cheated a little bit myself so um we had a little bit of um a, a, really a lot of experience gaming the system trying to figure out ways to break the system to abuse the cards to combine the cards in a way that just produced like an overpowered strategy and um we we had we had a lot of fun with that. Um, some of the most important lessons with Pokemon and all collectible card games really was the, um, the idea of abusing the system. So they gave you these cards that had 
text that, you know, we never had any problem interpreting the text properly, you know, but um, we would try to find ways to combine these cards in order to, to like unleash super powerful combinations. And so um, one other thing that, that we kind of figured out was there were certain, um, I will call them breakpoints. So this is the first time that I had an experience with breakpoints. So um, in Pokemon, you deal damage to your opponent's uh, creatures, and eventually after they've taken uh, an amount of damage equal to their health, they're defeated in combat. It's familiar because, you know, that's exactly how Deliverance works. You take lethal amount of damage, you're defeated, right? And your character's removed from the battlefield and all that. Well, for Pokemon, there were certain uh, points at which were more likely to defeat, or, you know, your characters were more likely to be defeated. So if I dealt, let's say, 50 damage with an attack, um, that's not likely to defeat another character. You know, if a Pokemon had 70 health, then theoretically they could take two hits at 50 damage, right? So I'd have to deal like 50 damage or and then 20 with another skill. But if I could figure out how to deal 70 damage in one swing, then it dramatically improved my efficiency as a card player i was able to beat characters with fewer moves there was less that my opponent could do in response if their pokemon was defeated they couldn't really respond right so that was something that i really worked in and so the concept of breakpoints you know like dealing 50 damage you know they had a uh, damage was in multiples of 10 so it was 50 60 70 damage 80 damage so on and so forth and um, what I learned was that, you know, dealing 50 damage or 60 damage, it was nice to add that 10 damage increase, but it was infinitely more uh, or infinitely stronger. I don't want to say infinitely, but it was orders of magnitude stronger to deal 70 damage rather than 60. And this concept is true in deliverance, too. The, the balance of deliverance is so fine in some cases where... You want every character to feel awesome, you know, like uh, Michael the Archangel, for example. He is able to deal um, eight damage right out of the gate in, on the easiest mode. A lot of the time, he can completely flatten one of the demons. So there are a lot of demons that only have eight health. Some demons have nine, and other demons, you know, have uh, less, right? So Michael, when he uh, moves towards something, uses overhand, overhand, mighty smite. That's two damage from overhand, two more damage from overhand, and four damage from mighty smite. This is before any of his stats are increased or whatever. Um, that's eight damage. And that is the most damage that any character can deal right out of the gate. So if something has nine health, they're going to be able to respond and deal damage back. But if something only has eight, then Michael can one-shot everything. So, um, you know, on his first round. Now, of course, there's a um, uh, always a, a trade-off. You know, you if you deal damage with Michael and you fail to use prey actions or you don't heal yourself, or whatever, then you know it's it's gonna gonna be painful. But uh, this is, you know, the the trade-offs are 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 meaningful. Um, but if Michael, let's say, dealt ten damage instead, he would be able to run through most of the enemies. Um, I mean, almost almost all of them. Everyone except for the Abomination and the Fallen Princes. So it is something that Michael can build to that point, but if he starts there, then the balance of the game is off. Michael becomes clearly the best character, the one that you should play if you want to win, and so on and so forth. Now, the scaling of a game is something that I'll get into later, but scaling is a different problem where sometimes in the beginning of a game, a character starts out weaker than others, but by the end of the game, the character is so strong that nothing can, like, they just will deal an inordinate amount of damage and then nothing can stand against them, right? If you build your character right. So I'll get into that later, I'm sure. But Pokemon really taught me how to optimize. It taught me how to, um, you know, bring the right tools to the right battle and certain, it taught me how to combine characters and, and, you know, certain uh, power ups and other things to um, get just a real, a, a great result. 
So and this kind of brings, you know, I'll, I'll mention other trading card games uh, first before I talk about Magic, which is the big one. Um, so let's talk about the WoW trading card game really quick. Uh, it was a game that was a lot of fun. I felt a lot like Magic the Gathering with um, elves and, you know, more your decks were more themed around like types of characters or, or, or other things like that. But um, the uh, World of Warcraft trading card game blended theme in a fun way with, um, a, you know, a theme that I loved with a type of game that I loved. And it was it was really cool. It's kind of a, a thing that I did with Deliverance. It found a I found a unique way to blend the theme with a game genre that I really loved. And so the World of Warcraft trading card game taught me that certain i mean certain decks there was a guy that ended up taking like third at the world championships that was at my local game store that played a deck filled with common cards and uncommon cards really easy to find and it was this elf deck that got very popular um and i learned that you don't have to make the good cards rare you can i mean it feels good to be overpowered it feels good not to have to spend a thousand dollars to make your deck good uh which is a common problem with magic a thousand dollars is like on the low end to make a really, really good deck in some formats. So um, there were others. We played Warlord. We played Magi Nation. We played, um, goodness, what were, I mean, I have so many cards that just kind of like sit around um, that I don't really use anymore, you know? Um, so uh, let's get into, oh, and then Yu-Gi-Oh! was another big one. Um, I played Yu-Gi-Oh! competitively as well at tournaments. It was a lot of fun. Um, couldn't really get I I don't know I just I played for a while just didn't feel like it had the strategic depth of magic uh this was back when Yu-Gi-Oh kind of first came out and all of the overpowered cards were there um Yada and all of the other cards that ended up getting straight up restricted and then banned outright because they you had to have them in your deck if you wanted to win um this uh, kind of leads me into there's sometimes there's like in in these types of games collectible card games one strategy that becomes so overpowered that you have to play that or you have a second rate um deck and you don't really have a chance so certain cards were so good that you had to use them if you you know all of the other cards were 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 decent but not as good as these and if you wanted to win you had to use these these cards right and that that actually feels terrible so in deliverance um, you know, I mean, you just kind of solved the game. It's like, well, you know, I have a, a 60 card deck or whatever it was, and um, 20 of my cards are already decided for me. So I guess the other 40 cards, I'm going to go with this strategy, you know, and, and that doesn't feel as good in those types of games. So um, now in uh, the one really cool thing about Yu-Gi-Oh! that I love were trap cards. Um, some of you know the Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, um, you know, series like TV show or whatever, like the, the old uh, anime that was like, you activated my trap card. It was like the famous line that came out of that. And that was really innovative. So the trap card was something that you would put down and it would activate when your opponent did something. You could choose to activate it when your opponent did something. It might destroy their monster. It might stop them from attacking. It might, you know, whatever it was. And there were other cards that you would uh, place face down in either an offensive or a, or a defensive position uh, it was one of the strategic areas with uh, strategy, I guess, in, in Yu-Gi-Oh! was how are you going to place your monsters? Face down, face up, attack position or defense position. And uh, there were certain cards that if they flipped face up into a defensive position, they got to do an extra effect. And, you know, um, so anyway, it's kind of a, a fun way to, you know, just... A nice a nice experience um the dominant collectible card game that has influenced deliverance more than any other is magic the gathering i played magic the gathering competitively and really hard through from about 1998 to like 2006. um i stopped collecting around 2005 and stopped going to tournaments at, by like 2006 um, I was a poor college student, and I really just didn't have the money to keep up with Magic. I had a ton of cards. I even had seven of the nine Power Nine cards. I had dual lands, like four of each kind of dual land. I really invested, 
everything I could into trading and winning tournaments and whatnot so that I could um, have like a really good deck. And actually my cousin ended up stealing my all my Power 9 cards. My It was, it was called a Type 1 deck. Um, I think it's called Vintage now. But this deck of cards that was basically worth at the time like five thousand um, dollars, I uh, was it was all stolen or or actually like ten thousand dollars. It was all stolen, probably sold so that he could get high or something like that. He was just a stupid twelve year old kid at the time, you know, and probably had no idea of the value of the cards. But uh, that's what he did, and that kind of it was the end of my competitive magic career. I was too salty and and hurt by it to uh, uh, to to try to collect those cards again so magic showed me um so i played through many years and it showed me um the the value of formats the interesting um you know when new cards were introduced it completely changed the whole metagame um the the best deck was no longer the best deck it had a counter and there were um certain strategies that used to be great but then with this new strategy or with this new deck that maybe was made up of cards that already existed that nobody found out about yet until this guy revealed it um you know it totally changed the totally changed the game and i loved that so a couple of things that magic really influenced deliverance number one um the card play in magic was very very intricate and awesome actually i, I just i think that it was it was fantastic they're making hundreds of millions of dollars a month selling Magic the Gathering because people are that enthralled with the card play and uh, it really is good. So Magic taught me the value of a um, of a technical writing in, uh, in Deliverance. There were oftentimes, there was only one way to interpret a Magic card. No matter how, um, you know, how many words were on that card, it was written in a manner that was so clear that it was it could have only been interpreted one possible way. Now, in Magic, they actually had so many cards that they had to, you know, and people want to try to abuse the system. They want to try to game the system and use a card in a way that maybe isn't intended. So they actually have judges that, that will tell you if this card is being played correctly. They have rules that, um, you know, are, is called errata. That is basically, hey, I know the old card that we printed says that, but now we're changing it so that it says this. So if you play the old version of the card, you can't play it the way it's written. You have to play it this new way. Um, so they have things that they, you know, that make it by them that is unintended. And or maybe they just straight up will ban a card. And so you're not allowed to play with that card in a tournament because it's by far the best card right now or it's being played too often or that kind of thing. But the value of technical writing that I learned from Magic really, really helped me design deli the Deliverance cards, um, write the Deliverance cards, come up with the keywords that matter in Deliverance, and the way that we say things, it's only one way. You know, I never say you, um, you know, so you are, you suffer X, you suffer one damage versus you're dealt one damage, ver you know, like that would mean the same thing, right? But suffer what does suffer mean what does i'm dealt damage versus i suffer damage like you know people will think oh well i suffer damage can it like is it impossible to prevent suffering damage where it's possible to prevent being dealt damage you know things like that are little things that you might not think make a huge deal but they can really make or break a game and uh take someone out of the immersive experience of of a game and with deliverance having you know uh, hundreds of cards in the game you really um you know you have to understand that things have to be written one way you know there has to be you know if i heal damage versus if i remove damage counters um you know uh that those those phrases matter um and they sometimes cause confusion on everything you know i have to look up you know what is healing damage versus like removing damage what what do those things mean and um you know cleansing a status effect versus removing a status effect um what is what is cleanse is cleanse a special phrase do i am i not playing this right those are questions that people ask themselves so um those are some of the conundrums that can arise if you 
don't have a solid technical writing ability. And I think that my experience in Magic the Gathering was probably the most influential in making sure that I knew how to write, you know, cards. Um, a lot of our cards are very similar to Magic. In fact, um, we have the Darkness cards function as enchantments, th cards that stay in play and have some sort of ongoing passive effect until they're removed. Um, artifacts and enchantments in Magic are kind of the same way. Um, we have uh, instants and what are called sorceries in Magic, where uh, in Magic Gathering they are cards that you play from your hand. You can play them instants, you can play at any time, it doesn't require an action, and you can interrupt the action. And oftentimes that's what those cards are meant to do. It's like, hey, my, my creature is going to attack you, and then you play this card, your opponent plays a card from your hand that's like, nope, destroy your creature, and then you're like, oh my goodness, you know, the 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 humanity of it all um when he surprises you so other cards these uh cards called sorceries they can only be played on your turn so they might be more powerful effects but you can't surprise people with them you know and uh so anyway those that kind of um we'll say that card play really made it made a strong appearance in deliverance with the prayer cards and the darkness cards um, in limited cases, we actually were able to apply the, um, the concept of like play anytime, not in action to character abilities or, you know, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. So whereas in magic, the kind of the, 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 the constraint in magic is land is the, you know, if you have enough mana to do something, then you can play the card. But if you don't have the right kind of mana or you don't have the right, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the amount that you need, then you're going to run into problems. And in Deliverance, the, the constraint is your actions. So you have a certain, a limited number of actions, two actions on your turn. You can kind of get added, you know, free actions, which are excellent. They don't count against that two action total. You can kind of relieve some of that that pain and and um you know that design space you're able to do do more with or decision space rather um you're able to do more with it um if you can find ways to kind of get around that two action total but um that's really where the the uh the skill of deliverance comes into play is partially at least from your characters the way you use your characters actions how efficient are you with your cards like in magic if you would destroy one creature with a card that had the potential to destroy two or three then you're not using that card to its full potential oftentimes in magic it comes down to i had let's say i played 10 cards and you played 10 cards but my 10 cards did more than yours let's say you know I only needed to use eight of my cards to deal with all of your 10. And now I have two creatures on the board that are attacking you that you can't do anything about. Or maybe you destroy one uh, during, a, during a, uh, a turn, but I just play another. And so you're constantly behind now because I was able to be more efficient than you were with the, with the cards. So um, that's very important. And that's, that actually is something that translates beautifully in deliverance. So um, there you go. So let's see the next, let's talk about, um, MMORPGs. These are massively multiplayer online RPGs, role-playing games, sorry. And they, they were extremely influential on, on me. Um, and my, you know, I guess my college life, you know, growing up college and then after college, very, very influential. Um, so in an MMO, you get one character and I started with World of Warcraft. I, I remember I just, I jumped in, I played, you know, a little gnome rogue, uh, Alliance rogue that, um, you know, I started and I gained levels and everything like that. But then I entered like new areas that had other players that were trying to uh, complete quests that I was on. I remember one person started a quest that I had as well but there was only one person that you could talk to and the person went off and like the, the non-player character, the computer basically went off and like walked off with that person. It was called an escort quest. You know, they were 
you know, escorting that person to a particular place, and that's how they would get to complete this quest to gain experience and items and whatnot. And I remember just sitting there, it was like level 10 in a place called Westfall, and, uh, you know, in World of Warcraft, and I was sitting there like, wait, what just happened? Like, the, the, the question mark went away. The person walked off with the, my quest person. I, I have to wait? And I remember all of a sudden, like, my mind was just blown up and open to this massive world that other people could influence. It was incredible. Um, one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had at gaming is realizing what this, this new world expanded my horizon so much. And in, you know, in the end, there were two areas that I excelled in World of Warcraft. I was a PDP or really, I guess three. I was a player, did player versus player. So I would do, uh, you know, I would run around in the world and try to beat up other uh, people from the other faction. I did that all the time. Eventually when they got into, uh, you know, PVP battlegrounds, I played a lot of battlegrounds. I, uh, did a lot of arenas and I earned, actually I became, um, uh, you know, ladies stay away, but I became a grand marshal in, uh, with the Alliance, uh, at classic world of Warcraft rank 14. It was extremely hard to get. I earned it with a friend of mine um, named Lawrence, and uh, we had um, a lot of fun doing that, but it was also like six months of work, 18 hours a day, playing really hard, and um, you know, two, two people splitting between the character in order to do it. Um, we, uh, I earned Gladiator in uh, World of Warcraft Arena. I was actually, at one time, I was ranked seventh in the United States and 33rd in the world for my what is called MMR, the rating that I had um, was extremely high. And I wasn't, I, I, World of Warcraft kind of transitioned, I transitioned from being a, a person who was good at gaming to a person who was the best, among the best in the world. And I played with people that were very famous on YouTube. You know, I played with, um, uh, my, one of my uh, teammates, one of my arena partners, ended up winning the first BlizzCon. Zillia, a paladin, ended up winning the first big World of Warcraft tournament. Uh, they won $100,000 uh, that they got to split between the, uh, three, three people at BlizzCon, the first BlizzCon. And the next BlizzCon, which was like two years later, I think, um, my other arena partner, the person I earned Gladiator with, um, took third place. Uh, with their three-person team at uh, at BlizzCon, and I was it was just cool to watch my friends winning tournaments or doing well in tournaments and making real money, and I I was able to hang with these people. I was able to play with them and go toe to toe against them and win sometimes, and it felt just felt really good. And in order to do that, I had to min max. I had to figure out how to do uh, like how to get the most damage out of, you know, in essence, what you're doing is you're just pressing buttons on your keyboard, trying to deal damage and, and prevent as much damage to your character as you can. Right. Uh, if you're a rogue like me, you're just pressing like, a you know, the same button over again. Right. So, um, anyway, the, the nuance to the PVP was extremely, extremely nuanced. I don't want to get into like all of it, but I'll say that, I knew at certain points against every single class, I knew the skills that they had that were like the emergency, oh no button, the oh crap, you know, I better, you know, live button. And I knew how to counter them. I knew when to attack them. I knew when to switch targets. I would even, you know, I was on, um, always on voice chat, just talking to people and we would, um, call out like, Hey, this Druid use nature swiftness, switch to the tar this target now. And you know, that target you're on is getting healed no matter what you do. And so we would switch targets and then we'd switch again to the Druid who was in the middle of the, of the field, trying to keep his, his people alive. And we would destroy him that way. And we had these tactics and strategy that were like overarching. And then we also had a very high skill level and understanding of the game that allowed us to really um, excel individually um you know in in battlegrounds and kind of adapt to certain situations and i really really wanted that to rem to be in deliverance i wanted as as angels fighting demons and and whatnot i wanted you to have this um 
like I wanted your best laid plans to get ruined. I wanted a card that came out to force you to change your your strategy. I wanted a demon that you were fighting to make you you know move, um, you know do something that you didn't intend. Maybe a, a darkness card came out that you couldn't get rid of, or a you know a, a, a demon his behavior changes because of a particular talent card and that makes you change your strategy. Maybe the order of your targeting has to change now because these demons can't be attacked until those ones are defeated. Um, and you know, that kind of thing. And I, I felt like that really added a layer of depth to the game without necessarily adding more complexity. The depth in the game is there to be discovered, but it's not hard to learn all of these rules. Um, and that's one of the things I really wanted to avoid. I wanted to avoid complexity in like an 80 page rule book that you had to read through. And, you know, here's the, the, well, let's say the 50 page rule book. Oh, and there's the a 30 page appendix that you need to uh, reference for the advanced interpretations of rules. I did not want that. So, um, you know, so that's one of the, one of the benefits that you guys get to receive uh, uh, with deliverance is just, a very elegant system and it took me five years to build deliverance to make deliverance to create the system in a way that that worked and part of that was honestly because when i started five years ago i had never designed a board game before but i will say that i knew what it felt like in or you know when when you had that epic decision space where it's like wow i feel like my decisions matter i feel like i'm an epically powerful character and oh my goodness, my best laid plans just got ruined, um, you know. And I I knew what it felt like, and I I just I tried a million things over five years to try to get it to to, to try to tighten deliverance, and it took a long time of trial and error to make that happen. And the um, I give MMORPGs a lot of credit for the feeling of what I wanted it to feel like. So, you know, the high highs and the low lows of, of PVP, you know, the, the lucky crit, you know, that some guy gets to, to wreck me when I was at low health or the fact that I kind of misplayed something and I, you know, I decided to blame lag instead of blaming, you know, myself, which is, you know, the guy that screwed up, you know, um, I knew the feeling of what it, of the high of, of the, the, the game, um, the um let's say in in pve so we would we would fight um epic gigantic bosses raid bosses in um in huge dungeons and they would at the time world of warcraft classic i played through a bunch of different you know expansions of world of warcraft but um you would have to enter a dungeon with 40 people and you would have to coordinate a strategy to to beat all of them and or, I'm sorry, to beat all of these bosses with your 40 people. And if some people kind of mess things up, they would die or they would cause extra trouble and you could actually end up everybody dying because you had a few people, you know, play poorly or whatever. Um, each boss within the dungeons that we would go into, um, I remember, I mean, just so many different examples of bosses. They had a, a, a particular strategy that you needed in order to um, to defeat them, and the more you practiced that strategy, the closer you came to beating the boss. I wanted that feeling in Deliverance, and so the um, you know the the bosses, the way that a boss feels in an MMO is the way that a fallen prince feels in Deliverance. There's uh, clearly a a um, uh, like an, a, a best way to defeat each boss. And what I do in higher levels of deliverance, so, you know, like, for example, you've got the Euphrates frogs. They are three bosses in, in on one card. And certain, you know, the, the, the frog that is the, um, uh, we'll say, like, the dragon frog, the red frog, his name is Armus, he hits really hard with his, his sword. And if you roll poorly... If it's their turn to act, they, they'll take multiple actions. Sometimes that guy will take three actions in a row and it will devastate you guys. So oftentimes the right move is to destroy that frog first so that he can't deal all that crazy damage. So the um, 
Uh, now, with the demon talent cards, I, m I make it so that uh, with a particular talent uh, for the Euphrates frogs, that you cannot, you are not allowed to damage that frog unless at least one other frog is defeated first. And that kind of changes the strategy. It forces you to adapt. Um, so that's probably the hardest example I have of, that I'm willing to share at least, of the, the um, you know, the, the game and the way that you're forced to adapt in, to different strategies, you know. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, every boss is different. And oftentimes the, the overarching strategy is, you know, you can't, you can't just pour damage into that boss and win. You have to position them properly or you have to, you know, defeat them in a certain time frame. Or maybe you have, you've got to defeat all the other demons first or maybe the order that you beat them matters or, you know, a lot of different, uh, different things. And um, or maybe the tools you bring to the, the table. Maybe you need a lot of area of effect damage. Maybe you need a lot of single target damage, um, you know, different you know, little nuances really change the way that it feels. And, um, you know, one of the other important elements that translates from deliverance or translates from MMORPGs to deliverance is the um, enrage timer. I don't know if you guys know what an enrage timer is, but it's basically a, um, well, I'll, I'll explain it with an actual boss. So there was a dungeon called Nax Ramus where you would fight, um, the Lich King, you fight the, the, you, whatever. So, uh, one of the bosses and it had a bunch of different bosses in it. It was like 15 bosses inside this, the raid bosses inside this one dungeon. And one of them was called patchwork. Patchwork was this, um, abomination that basically hit extremely hard, really hard. And he had a lot of health. And at the end of five minutes, or actually I think it was six minutes, Patchwork would enrage, and what this means is he already dealt a lot of damage, but all of a sudden at six minutes, his damage would spike, and he would just beat everyone in one shot, and as soon as he would start attacking, he would destroy your tank right away, and then he would turn and kill like all of your damage dealers, and then he would run after all your healers, and it, meanwhile, all of these, all of the damage dealers are trying to survive and deal damage and try to beat him before the inevitability of everyone being you know of everyone dying of everyone being destroyed and having to try the encounter again so um this fight is a great example of what is called a gear check you need to have enough damage in order to actually get past him right so you have to defeat him in five minutes or six minutes so the concept of the enrage timer is really important in deliverance because if you're able to like stabilize on a boss, if you know you can theoretically, if he deals you five damage and you can heal for six damage, and that's just the 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 extent of the the fight, then you're always going to be able to live, right? And um, I I want and that of course kills all of the tension. You know, if you know that you're going to live and you know that there's no chance this boss has to defeat you, then there's no tension and the game's not really fun. So I wanted every boss to have some sort of concept of there's, there's like, it has to be a crescendo in every single encounter. That means if you either have to make it right over this hump and then you, you did it, or you are going to die. You are going to die. You have to beat him in time. You can't, you can't let him get to this point um, or you're going to lose. So, um, those things are really critical. And actually that is in, you know, where it translates to deliverance is the, um, uh, the stronghold cards. So in the fallen prince decks, you have certain cards with the stronghold icon. These cards cannot be removed from play and they, they take up a spot on the darkness track permanently. So if you're playing a, you know, a two player game, normally you get two cards a turn and you can usually cast card enough cards down to kind of keep the track at bay. Um, but with these cards, they permanently fill up a slot. And what that means is that there are fewer slots remaining for, for future turns. So now, you know, with two or three slots taken up, two cards coming out a turn is kind of devastating. And if you're playing four players, I mean, four cards a turn, 
can be extremely devastating. And you have, you know, you might have more resources with four players, but the cards coming out are really, really dangerous now because so many are coming out and there are so few places for them to go. So um, that is kind of the enrage timer of deliverance um, of every boss. So, um, you know, I played a lot of MMOs. I played um, Ion, which was really fun. That was kind of like Angels and Demons. Asmodee and Elios were the two races there. And that was really fun. Um, the, uh, of course, Ion, uh, Ion, in addition to Ion, we played Rift. We played Guild Wars 2. Um, we played a lot of Elder Scrolls Online, which was super fun. I love playing Elder Scrolls Online. Um, let's see. Um, you know, just, I mean, a, a ton of them, a ton of them. Now, let's move into MOBAs, mini online battle arenas. And by the way, guys, so that you know, anybody that's watching right now, I'm going to be putting this video on YouTube so that everybody can... Um, can skip through to their sections that they're interested in. And I'm doing it on Facebook Live right now so that it can be up for everybody, but also so that I can actually just download the video and then upload it later. I think, you know, I just thought, hey, it'd be edifying um, for everybody to uh, to have this for reference and, and, you know, if anybody wants to. I can't really see comments right now. I don't know why, but, um, you know, if you ask a comment, I'll I'll make sure to, or if you ask a question in the comment section, I'll make sure to address it. Um, so let's get into MOBAs. MOBAs, mini online battle arenas. This is also where you control one character and you would um, gain, you know, items and get, get, re get gold and um, gain levels and get more powerful and your abilities, you gain new abilities and they get stronger and so on and so forth. And your goal is to defeat, basically you're going to destroy your opponent's nexus. This is a building located in the center of your opponent's base. It's kind of their stronghold. It's really hard to get to. And you've got to grow in power and then destroy these towers on your way through this path to their, to their base. And so it's kind of almost like a, a tug of war. So you're tugging, you know, back and forth, you know, you're, you destroy your opponent's tower and then they push back and destroy your tower. And then, you know, you kind of push into their base and then you destroy some buildings in their base and they push back and do that to you and so on and so forth until somebody destroys the, the, um, you know, I guess it's almost like capture the flag. Like if somebody gets to your, your nexus and destroys that, then you lose. And, and if you do that to your opponent, you win. So, um, pretty easy to understand. But every single character, and you only control one character, every character that you play has a very unique play style, very unique um, actions that they can do. Um, only like four abilities, but those abilities work together in a way that is very interesting. So um, the, um, in addition to that, actually, there are roles that you would take. So certain characters are better at tanking damage, other characters are better at dealing damage. Other characters are better at supporting and healing and so on and so forth. And you want to have a good combination of characters that can, you know, maybe carry the game at the end or maybe are a big, huge threat at the beginning or, you know, other things like that. And I took beyond everything else. I really took the idea of a character's toolkit, you know, the abilities that they come with that really kind of define how their play style is that that is represented so clearly in the um, the angels of deliverance. You you know, Michael is this berserker warrior that just wants to be in the front lines of combat and hit things with a big sword. Um, Miko is not that way at all. She is very much position based movement matters to Miko and she wants to kind of dart in and out of combat. Um, Azrael or let's say Shula wants to stand kind of in the back lines and lob heavy damage from far away or support from far away. Sardius is a tank that, that is kind of a support. Um, you know, he heals other people and deals damage from far away and he helps move other people into position and that kind of thing. And these skills are, it's not very complicated to actually learn a character because the skills themselves are represented right on their character sheet. 
the only actions you can take at the beginning of the game are the ones that are on your character's card. And uh, that kind of allows me, it gives me enough freedom to give every character a different flavor. And that's really what it's all about. You know, every character has the potential to deal a ton of damage. In, an, in, a, in a MOBA, you know, every character has the potential to, you know, Hulk smash, right? But certain characters do it better than others, and certain characters do it in, I mean, characters do it in different ways, very different from each other. Certain, uh, let's say, Lux, for example, from League of Legends, one of my favorite characters that I love to play, um, she is very much combo-based. So she's based on you know, getting somebody like within a split second, you deal all your damage in a split second by using all of your abilities at the right time. Your skill shots all have to hit perfectly. And um, if you deal that damage, you, you kind of have a cooldown period where you can't really do very much after that. You have to wait till your abilities kind of come back up before you can try it again. And other characters are, you know, they'll get really beefy and all they want to do is auto attack. They just click on you and he's going to chase after you and punch you just a bunch of times until you're defeated. That's the way that they work. So um, the idea behind this is that every character feels different. They have a certain skill that kind of defines their character and who they are and how they act and how you want to build them and what they're good at. Um, and oftentimes that skill is, you know, they might have four skills or whatever, but uh, you know, in Deliverance, the angels have five skills. One is a prey action, and there are four skills that determine kind of what they're good at. And then you get to expand those skills with talents, which is really cool, that lets you kind of customize your character even further, um, which actually kind of harkens back to World of Warcraft again with talent trees. You've got um, certain, you know, if you wanted to be, let's say, a rogue that just dealt tons of damage, you would go into... Um, assassination and combat and then if you wanted to be a rogue that dealt high amounts of burst damage but less overall you would go into subtlety and assassination and uh, so anyway very very interesting the way that the characters are built but with you know kind of coming from MOBAs it was very much a, um, a, a the understanding that characters are built around one skill all I need to do is find one skill so for example Uriel is built around his crucible skill. Um, crucible is, uh, it requires an action the first time you use it. It costs two courage and it deals, it allows you to move and deal a certain amount of damage to an opponent at the same time. It's not a very, you know, uh, like super skillful move or anything. It just, you get to move and smack something. But after you use it the first time, it becomes a free action from that point on. So the free action is, you know, when you get to use it the second time, the third time, the fourth time, and the real skill with Uriel is to figure out how to use that skill more than once in a single round. So uh, the most I've ever used Crucible is four times in a round. In fact, it may be actually five times. Um, and it felt amazing. I just decimated like all the bad dudes on the map with this skill and it felt so good. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the skill that defines him. There are other skills that define characters that are not damaging skills. Miko, I had mentioned, she has a passive skill called Ebb and Flow that, that says you must move one space before using an action or after using an action. So you use an, a free action or an action that costs you, you have to move before or after. And so you may position yourself well or poorly, depending on your choices there. And every one of your moves, even the prey action, is, de is defined by where am I going to move after using my action? And how am I going to plan my turn? How am I going to plan my future turns? Because this is how my character moves, which is very different. Um, you've got Christine. Her skill, uh, Lightning Stab, is... A very powerful skill that will um, it deals damage in a kind of a plus you know you pick a space and then everything above below left and the right of that skill is dealt damage and that allows you to do some really interesting things you can you know target a space two range away in order to hit the guy that's around the corner because it deals damage in that interesting pattern and um, it it's almost like Christina's like a um, 
a melee mage. She's like Gandalf or something, you know, she's uh, deals a lot of area of effect damage and she actually has fewer free actions than the other angels, but she has a very, very strong area of effect damage. So the way that you would become, you know, like the way that you would wield her in higher difficulties is that you would use um, her abilities to hit more than one enemy at the same time. So that is kind of how you become efficient with Christine, right? And her toolkit is built around that style of play. So it completely changes the game. Um, so those are a lot of the, the lessons that I learned in, in uh, Dota and League of Legends. Um, I played Dota back when it was called Defense of the Ancients on Warcraft 3 uh, as, a, as a mod. I played League of Legends all the way. I mean, I played it for a long time. Gosh, I probably stopped playing it around like 2015. Um, but I still watch it on Twitch TV just for entertainment purposes. It's one of the things I do when I'm waiting for something or when I just am looking to entertain myself, I'll go turn on League of Legends on uh, uh, Twitch TV. And um, the, uh, you know, that's been a very influential game on me. The highest I ever reached, I believe, was Platinum 4. So uh, in ranked play, I reached Platinum 4, which is pretty high, um, you know, for, for a filthy casual like myself. Um, now, a uh, digital collectible card game, Hearthstone gets a special mention here because I became a professional Hearthstone player. Um, Hearthstone is a game released by Blizzard that kind of took, you know, Magic and all of the other collectible card games and put it in a digital format that where they really took full advantage of the fact that you could do certain things in a video game that you just can't do on a tabletop. And this showed me, um, I mean, the first thing that this showed me is I can't, I mean, I really wanted to give every character, you know, 10 different stats. And I wanted you to have like, you know, damage everywhere, like add up your damage points and this and that. But it doesn't feel fun when you're playing Deliverance and you have to do math. You know, if you have to be an accountant or like a tax attorney in order to play Deliverance, it's not going to have a very wide appeal. So I needed players to figure out, like, to easily be able to add up the damage they dealt, to easily figure out how much damage they received, and so on and so forth. And the digital CCG Hearthstone really showed me what I had to do in a regular card game that a video game could just take care of. And it, it kind of actually helped me see ways that I could port the video game stuff back over to tabletop. So... For example, um, Magic the Gathering, you had, you know, you could attack and your creature had two power and that means it, it deals two damage. Um, your opponent gets to decide what they want to do. And then they're like, okay, I'll just take your two damage to, to the face. And you say, oh, actually, I'm going to play 10 cards that add, you know, 12 damage on it, uh, on top of this. And, you know, just an exaggeration. But then all of a sudden it's like, well, what am I going to do? And in the end of the day, it's like, or at the end of this whole gigantic sequence, it's like, all right, I guess I take six damage instead of, you know, and doing something like that in a game like Magic is is crunchy, and that's kind of the core of the game. Some, like, a big explosion like that will happen maybe once or twice in a game, and it's like, that's what determines who wins or loses. It's like, who kind of comes out on top of those exchanges, or how many cards you had to burn in order to survive, or whatever it was. And in um, Hearthstone, it was like your opponent could do nothing on their turn or on your turn. Sorry. Your opponent could do nothing on your, if it was my turn, I do the things and my opponent does not. So I got to attack. I got to decide who I wanted to attack. I got to, you know, if my character did five damage, it always did five. There was no, Oh, surprise, you know, for my opponent in limited cases there, there are, but uh, which actually come down to traps. You you, you know, Hearthstone really leveraged Yu-Gi-Oh's traps. Um, and so the math became really easy in Hearthstone. And I found fun ways to kind of port this back into a tabletop experience with, with Deliverance. Um, you gain stat points from your Heavenly Treasure cards, which increase your damage dealt and other things like that. But that's the only place that you'll find increases in damage. 
are from your stats and sometimes your talents but but either way everything is right in front of you in front of your character card it's really easy to add up there's you know um if you if you have two strength on your character you don't have to see how much strength is on each one of your items you just look at okay my strength is red it's a you know the red sword icon i have two strength and i have another two red sword icons on my gear so that adds another two it's really easy to see at a glance and this is one of the things that we kind of ported over from hearthstone uh, it, was, it was very influential um so uh i earned legend i actually became a uh, writer for a very popular uh, website which actually doesn't exist anymore it was called iHearthU.com. um i i created one of the most popular articles on iHearthU.com. And I, um, people sought me out to teach them how to play Hearthstone. So I made like 400 bucks a week, um, you know, some, well, on good weeks, uh, teaching people how to play Hearthstone, how to get legend at Hearthstone. Um, okay, so I have two more. The next one is action RPGs. So we're talking Diablo, Path of Exile, Sacred, um, I remembered, uh, Elder, of course, Elder Scrolls, Morrowind, Oblivion, Skyrim, um, Dragon Age was really fun. You know, a bunch, a bunch of these types of games. Um, Champions of Norath and Baldur's Gate. And a lot of these are kind of like Dungeons and Dragons in a video game, especially a game like Baldur's Gate. Um, these are really inspired by, originally, you know, the tabletop game Dungeons and Dragons. And as somebody who I have, you know, never actually played an RPG, uh, when I when I say this, a tabletop RPG, where it's like there's a dungeon master telling you what happens, and you have to roll your twenty sided dice to see what happens uh, with your, you know, perception check. And I've never played something like that, but I have played, or I've never actually played a tabletop RPG version of uh, of Dungeons and Dragons. However, action RPGs are D D in a video game so uh diablo diablo one two three um path of exile and and sacred and all of these games are so similar in the way that they kind of put everything together but baldur's gate really gave me the understanding baldur's gate 2 in particular on the pc um minsk and boo were my favorites if anybody if anybody uh, watches this and knows what who those guys are shout out in the comments um the Baldur's gate gave me a, an understanding of constitution and strength and charisma and all of those things and how those kind of interact and how they use those in rpgs to to kind of enhance your ability to to complete certain tasks or to influence people or whatever um and what I really loved about these these games is they had your character you you kind of built in a certain way. Generally, like Diablo, you would have one or two skills that you would use, and you would try to position yourself well so you didn't take too much damage, and you would build your character with loot and other things that would allow you to be more tanky and allow you to survive more and deal more damage and so on. And I loved that about these games. They also had something that isn't in Deliverance, but I really loved, which was trading. I loved trading. I learned how to take advantage of the auction house, and I basically learned economics and capitalism through Diablo and World of Warcraft, the auction house system, and, and other games like that. But, um, and I, again, I haven't, you know, ported that into Deliverance in any way, but the, probably the most influential element of these games was uh, were unique enemies. So this is actually what inspired the talent system. This is originally what inspired the talent system with uh, Deliverance. I wanted, uh, you know, was, no, I'm sorry, the original angel talents were inspired by, like, talent trees in MMOs, but demon talents actually came from a different place. They came from... You know, there was, uh, let's say, I don't know, like a little, uh, like a, a little monster in uh, Diablo. The, uh, I don't know, like an imp. You would have these little imps that were the same kind of dudes, and they were kind of like cannon fodder that you would just run over, and, and you know, you would feel ultra strong as you were knocking out these little stupid imps. 
However, every once in a while, you would run into an imp that was a, simply a different color. The imp was, let's say, blue. And that blue meant that he was more resistant to ice damage, and he was more, he dealt additional ice damage to you, or cold damage to you. And because he was there, he also forced, he also caused every other one of the imps around him to deal more damage, ice damage, and then, you know, or cold damage, and then take less. Uh, cold damage from you and it kind of tweaked the experience a little bit certain skills were or certain you know traits that these demons or these monsters would have would really force you to change your strategy um thorns aura was a big one i i would i remember playing diablo 2 hardcore and i would get to like level 70 which was really really high for hardcore Hardcore is if you die once, you're, you have to make a new character. You're entirely destroyed. You cannot revive. You are gone, and you have to make a new one. And I remember playing that, and every time I was defeated was due to Thorn's aura. I would play and run and hit some guy, and I would deal him 100 damage, and Thorn's aura would basically deal 50 damage back to me. So because of my own damage that I dealt, I was part of that was reflected back to me. And I remember by the time, you know, whenever I would die from Thorn's Aura, I would always um, be, uh, it would just come as a, such a shock, such a surprise. It's like, dang it, some random minion all of a sudden had this new trait that caused me to get entirely wiped out. And I wanted, I didn't like the feeling of getting entirely wiped out because of that randomness, but I, I, I added this into deliverance i added the idea of certain demons and deliverance will have different traits some will be abusive others will be tyrannical others will be massive and they might change you might have meddling imps that are linked that you have to kind of they where they share damage and that totally changes the way that you would approach a battle um you might have uh four fallen seraphs on the battlefield and one of them is a champion which would be you know, that, that Fallen Seraph deals extra damage and gets to move extra and, and has more health, you know. Um, it really makes the game interesting. And that came from, and by the way, the combinations of things. So demons, let's say you can have a champion who is massive. You can have explosive meddling imps who, you know, when they run towards you, they will explode if they're next to you and that share health or that share damage between each other it makes for a really crazy fun experience as you get better at the game you you want things like that and this was a way with just 40 cards it's the uh, the number of of demon talents that we have 20 minor demon talents and 20 major and then each fallen prince gets their own special set of three a piece um they just really caused the game to be extremely replayable because the challenge is very um it's just uh different every time you know it's there's a different flavor every time um now let's get into board games board games i i uh, i played board games back of course as a kid I mentioned I played collectible card games, which I don't consider a board game. I do consider them like in similar, kind of a similar realm, um, but they're more like lifestyle games. Where if you if you have one card game, that's like the the one thing that you do, right? Magic the Gathering players only want to talk about magic. They only want to play Magic the Gathering. They'll play other games if they have to, but they always have a Magic deck ready to play someone else, you know. And so that's a um, uh, a real lifestyle type of game. Uh, Warhammer 40k kind of bridges the gap a little bit or other like tabletop skirmish games like that. Um, I'm, I did play Warhammer 40k but uh, and also Hero Clicks and whatnot. I'm not going to talk so much about those because they weren't super influential other than the fact that minis are awesome and people love minis and that's why we have angel minis in the game. Um, but the um, I did used to paint minis but I was no good at it. So board games, um, the time that I got serious about board games, October 1st, 2015, I quit video games cold turkey. I remember the last video game I ever really played was Elder Scrolls Online. And uh, my wife and I, we would love PVPing in that game. But then when we quit, 
we had to find another way to kind of get that fantasy itch. The uh, I want to transport myself to another world and have some sort of epic uh, character building experience, you know. And that came in uh, or from board games. Board games, I, I just had no idea the depth and the awesomeness that was possible in a board game. And so I played um, Catan. You can see some of the the new ones over there, or the, the old school ones over there. There's Catan. We have Pandemic somewhere. Um, you know, we got uh, actually one of the first one of the first games I got was War of the Ring. Uh, that game right there is not for the faint of heart. That took me like three days to finish my first game. I was kind of a newbie at uh, at those games, you know. Um, but you know, now I mean, this isn't even all my games. I've got tons of games downstairs and that kind of thing. Um, that I actually should probably bring upstairs. But um, playing board games, I just got, I don't know what it is about board games, but I just wanna play more games and new games. So sometimes, you know, it would be, it would be a, um, uh, like I would play a game once and I'd be like, oh, that was amazing. Let me buy another game and then play that too, you know? And it was uh, just a game that I would play once or twice and then be on to the next game. And, uh, it was, it was so hard for me to, to settle down, but every single game we played was just a, um, a, a massive influx of knowledge of, wow, I didn't know. Like, for example, pandemic, when I played pandemic the first time, there were, there were lots of games have had like very shocking things, um, to, uh, you know, just as far as my experience with those games, very shocking and, uh, you know, expanded my, my horizons. Pandemic was one of them where it was cooperative. And I remember the first epidemic card came out. And uh, if you guys know pandemic, you know that pand epidemics are why the game is hard, uh, why the game can be hard. Um, so the uh, infection cards that, that come out that, that would um, cause cities to be infected um, get discarded. Then when you draw an epidemic card, those cards that previously infected those cities are shuffled and then put back on top of the infection deck for you to draw again. Now, I was used to shuffling cards and, you know, shuffling decks and, and whatnot, but the cards that are the most dangerous to you that have, you know, disease cubes on the board, those cards are going to be the first ones that you draw from the deck. And that blew my mind. And actually, I called that for a very long time. I didn't. I don't think that this is an actual term in board game design, but I called that an intensity mechanic. I was. It was the one thing that all of a sudden made the game intense, and you know the the tension was was really amazing um, from that one little thing that they did. So that was actually the inspiration, original inspiration for the darkness deck. We I wanted something that would intensify a tactical combat experience because one of the things about tactical combat is it feels like there are a dime a dozen and you're just generally punching stuff in the face and the the more loot you get it just the harder you get to punch stuff in the face and the easier the game is i didn't want it to be like that i wanted there to be some level of strategy and tactics that if you ignored this thing that you were going to lose and so the darkness deck was my answer to just punch it harder, right? You know, Michael the Archangel just wants to punch stuff. But if you don't pray in Deliverance, it doesn't matter what difficulty level you're on, you're probably going to lose the game. And that makes things really interesting. Um, it causes what eventually became the core loop of the game to be really, really fun, which is balancing that tactical combat against the darkness cards. And the secret, which is no secret, is that you cannot balance both you're going to fall behind in one and then you're going to expend a bunch of resources to catch up only to fall behind in the other. Right. And that's where I think the real fun in, um, deliverance comes from. So, um, there were a lot of other games that were very influential in, um, in deliverance, the, or two deliverance, the, uh, one of them would be Lord of the Rings journeys of middle earth. I know it only came out in 2019, but, we have played that game so many times. I mean, probably 80 playthroughs of Journeys of Middle-Earth. Um, and 
we've we've just had or not I'm uh, not 80 playthroughs I'm sorry 80 plays maybe 100 plays of Journeys into Middle Earth and that game you feel like you are in this you you feel like you're Legolas or Gandalf or whatever and it it it's really cool how the theme is connected to the actual game and the mechanics of the game um Dead of Winter is another game probably the strongest theme based game I have on my shelf aside from Deliverance um, which I, I actually don't think Deliverance has a stronger implementation of theme uh, that of, than Dead of Winter. I think that they're both, like, top-tier implementation, um, where I would consider Jer Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Middle-Earth, maybe, like, you know, a B uh, for theme integration with the actual gameplay. I consider Dead of Winter and Deliverance to be the two games that I have on my shelf that are, like, like high A. The theme is... is permeates everything that you do in these games and so dead of winter really really influenced me a lot as as to the kind of how a game could make me feel and so i i really started to think in terms of how what experience i wanted my players to have and how i wanted them to feel when they were playing my game and so that in deliverance i want you to feel like you're this epically powerful angel capable of just dominating all these demons but at the same time i wanted you to feel like you were about to lose uh, I, so you're this epically powerful angel who is about to die and that is kind of the core experience of of the game it's like wow i feel so strong but oh my goodness we're gonna lose so um that's the uh that's a lot those are in fact a lot of the other games that that really influenced deliverance and i don't know let me look let me look and just see i mean some of the other games on the shelf, um, gosh, I mean, there's a bunch. There are a bunch of games that taught me things that I don't want to do. Um, I'll I'll mention one other, Star Realms, little little deck builder. I have I I love deck building. Obviously, I'm a Magic the Gathering uh, player, so I have Lord of the Rings LCG. I've got Marvel Champions LCG. I've got um, uh, Star Realms dominion and a bunch of expansions and 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 others but the thing that i love about star realms is how simple it is to start and how the cards that you bought that were simple gain a secondary use um and that's one of the i think that that's one of the things i i really loved about star realms and the talents in deliverance i wanted them to kind of build upon each other in the same way so if you built you know, Shula's light build, then you would get certain skills that are more, that, that allows uh, your other skills to be just simply more effective, or you can leverage them in different ways now, and that kind of thing, so, um, anyway, that's, uh, that, oh, uh, one other, one other game I really want to point out, um, Pandemic Legacy, season one, so the legacy genre really showed me what a campaign can be, and how, you know, I mean, everyone is, all about like Gloomhaven and other games that are like, you know, you can choose your own adventure and there are, you know, everyone wants to see like tons and tons of missions and that sort of thing. But the way that a linear campaign can tell a story is really cool. And the twists and turns that where you can f get shocked and surprised and whatnot, the, the twist that awaited me in that pandemic legacy box season one was really great. I have season two. Uh, we're actually partway through it. I haven't, finished it and then there's season zero which i kind of look forward to um i got kind of pandemic out after the uh the the after finishing the campaign it was awesome but it was like all right now i need a break so um the uh the idea behind pandemic was being able to tell a story and also to open a component that is locked that feels really cool so in deliverance there's one box that is locked and sealed that you're not allowed to open until the final chapter, the final act of the campaign. And you, you know, so it just, number one, it entices players who want to actually play the, through the campaign to open the box and see what's inside. But number two, uh, something that I realized I didn't like was I didn't like ripping up a card in Pandemic Legacy. You know, they tell you to rip up a card. One of the first things that, that you do. And um, it's, it definitely des delivers like an impact that surprised me, but it kind of breaks the immersion. It's like, all right, I'm ripping up my, my toy that I bought. 
Um, it doesn't feel like an immersive experience. It does feel a little shocking, but not in the same way that the uh, the twist, you know, felt in 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 that game. So I wanted to kind of showcase a linear campaign that had a meaningful story and an awesome story um, that uh, let you open up a box in the in the end, and uh, that would add permanent new content to the game. So. Uh, replayable in skirmish mode and the campaign so uh, I'm sure there are others and uh, oh also I'll, I'll mention one last I know I just said this but um, there's a game called Unbroken right there and uh, made by Golden Bell Studios I know that's not necessarily the most popular company in Kickstarter uh, right uh, at all but it's a really great solo game solo only and I wanted Deliverance to have an excellent solo experience I love playing solo games, but it always bugs me when I have to play a solo game, in essence, playing two-handed. When you play a solo experience that you're really just playing two players, but you're playing two players yourself, I get, you know, some people like doing that. I don't mind doing it. You know, I have a lot of fun playing two players, you know, like campaign style, like Lord of the Rings, Journeys of Middle Earth is one of the games that asks you to play at least two characters. You want to solo you play with at least two characters. But my wife and I can play with two characters, and it's, like, kind of the same, but it's, you know. So I wanted to have an experience that would be perfect for the solo player and would offer a unique, not just a different experience, but, like, a, a great solo experience that's memorable and that also, you know, I didn't like it that, you know, certain games had encounters that were designed for solo like here are five solo scenarios but all the other scenarios are not solo you have to play with two or three characters um i wanted every scenario in deliverance to be capable of being played by a solo player so that's exactly what we did and i am really excited to share that uh, to share more of that i know we've got some solo content a lot of people are playing solo on discord and having a blast um so that's that kind of wraps it up. Um, if you have any questions about the uh, all of the experience of my gaming, um, you know, f feel free to ask in the comments below. If anything kind of stood out to you, if you wanted me to expand more, um, please feel free to write something in the comments or send me a message, and we will uh, see. You. Hopefully, I'll see you at a convention or across the table someday. But from uh, until then. I really appreciate your support on uh, with Deliverance, and um, we will uh, uh, catch you next time.